Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lana Johnson. I am with Advanced Resources, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Job Seeker webinar. We'd like to make you an offer. And so I'm going to be your speaker for today's session. A little bit about myself. I have been in the staffing industry for 21 years. I actually just celebrated my 21st anniversary with Advanced Resources this week. And so I have played a number of different roles within the advanced group organization, including seven years as president of advanced resources. And so I have interviewed hundreds of candidates. I have helped hundreds of clients in their desire to hire the best talent. And so I feel very qualified to be your speaker today on this topic. And I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. And definitely after today's presentation, if there are any questions that you have, um, feel free to reach out to me, um, either via LinkedIn or via email. My email address is ljohnson at advancedgroup.com. And so a little bit of information about today's webinar. First of all, it's not that I don't want to hear from you, but for the purpose of minimizing distractions for all of our guests on our webinar today, everyone has been muted so that we don't hear any background noise or what have you. You can ask a question at any time during the session by using the question feature on GoToWebinar. I will not stop the presentation to answer questions, but I will leave time at the end of the session to go through all of the questions that have been submitted. And if we run out of time, I promise to respond back to you, follow up with you one-on-one -on -one and make sure that your question gets answered. After um, we are recording this session, after the webinar within the next 24 to 48 hours, we will send a link to the recording of the session as well as a copy of the slides out to all of our participants. So you will be getting an email. And you can also find the slides and the recording on our website, um, along with all of the other sessions that we have recorded in the past. So for those of you who are not familiar with advanced resources, we are part of the advanced group of companies. And so there are four businesses under that umbrella. Advanced resources is one of them. And then we also have Advanced Clinical, Advanced RPO, which stands for Recruitment Process Outsourcing, and then Wonderland Group. And Advanced Clinical does staffing for um, pharmaceutical, life sciences, clinical research positions, and Wonderland is a marketing and creative staffing firm. And then Advanced Resources has five placement specialties, human resources, technology, healthcare, accounting and finance, and office support. We have five locations, um, currently, four of them are here in the Chicagoland area. Last summer, we expanded to New York City, and then we'll be announcing in July that we are expanding to Dallas, Texas. So, um, so we have a lot of exciting growth going on. We've been in business for nearly 30 years, and our focus is really on insight results and excellence. Um, insights, that's what we're doing today, sharing our knowledge about um, the job search process, you know, we're very focused on results, both for our candidates and for our clients. And then in terms of excellence, we really want to focus on a wonderful experience for all of our clients and for all of our talent. We're one of the top award-winning staffing firms in the United States. We're a best of staffing award winner. And so that's enough about advanced resources. We will now dive right into today's topic, which is what you do when you receive a job offer. And it might seem fairly obvious what you do when you receive the job offer. Of course, you accept it, right? Or you negotiate. But we think that there are some tips and some pointers, and some simple things that you can do once you are either getting an offer or when you have received an offer so that you can have a very smooth offer acceptance process. And the vision here and the goal here, the outcome that we want you to achieve is that you start your new job feeling great about the opportunity and the, and the employer feels great about you starting and, um, and everything, you know, everything that goes into accepting an offer has been checked off and you know all the details and, and you can focus on putting your best foot forward. And so we think that there are four areas that we're going to focus in on making that vision happen. And so the first area is getting an offer, of course, and then um, reviewing the offer. Once you have the offer, what are those critical things that you should look at? Negotiating the offer. So sometimes an offer 
is perfect. It's exactly what you expected, but many times it's not. And so we'll talk about what to do in that scenario. And then finally, how you should accept the offer, again, to have your best foot forward. So let's talk about getting the offer. So it's the most exciting phase, right? I mean, you have put so much time and energy and effort into the job search process, probably been stressful at certain stages or maybe all of the stages. You've prepared for the interview, you've followed up, and you finally have a job offer. And it's a very, very exciting time. There are some signals that you might be getting along the way that are telltale signs that maybe an offer is coming. And so some of these seem fairly obvious, but the hiring manager might be really selling you on the company. So they know that you're a fit, they want you to join. They know, maybe they know that you are interviewing at other organizations and they're really giving you the, the hard sell on why their company is great, why their team is great, why their vision is great. So that's definitely usually a sign. The people that you're meeting with might be talking in phrases that it, that are like you're already in the job, right? So, so you will be doing this, or you will be working with this group of people, or you will be sitting over here. And I'll tell you again, as someone who has interviewed hundreds of candidates, a little inside trick: um, if I if I'm interviewing someone and I just know that they're not a fit for whatever reason, maybe they're not have you. I specifically avoid using language that makes them feel like. I can see them in the position. So I would say instead of saying like, you would be working with these people, my language would be the person that we hire would be working with this team. So it's just a little bit of a kind of an insider thing, but you might also be introduced to other managers. You might get a tour around the office. Um, you know, and again, if I'm interviewing someone that I don't think is a fit, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to lead them on. I don't want to take up their time. My time is precious as well. So it's definitely a telltale signal. You might find out that the company has checked your references. And so your friends or colleagues that you have asked to be references for you will probably let you know, hey, you know, awesome company incorporated called me and, and checked up on a reference for you. The employer might start to talk about or start to talk about compensation, or they might start to talk about potential start dates. And so that's obviously a clear buying signal. You know, if you're, if you're looking at houses or you're looking at cars or any major purchase, you know, once you start to ask about the dollars, that's a clear buying signal. And that's also the case when you're interviewing. The employer might ask for references or they might tell you, they might start talking about, you know, their background check process. If they do criminal background checks or drug screenings or anything of that nature. So again, that's a buying signal. And then the employers, managers, executives, or other employees might be connecting with you on LinkedIn, right? So that definitely happens and that's a buying signal as well. And then it happens, you get the offer, right? And you might get the offer either through email, likely you will get a phone call. And the thing here is to obviously be responsive and reply back right away. And when you reply back, you want to show your enthusiasm and thank them and express your appreciation. You definitely want to make sure that you have the offer in writing. And so this is really important. So you, you don't really have an offer until you have the offer in writing. And you, know, and you should um, you know, definitely never accept before you have that written offer letter, but if you if they haven't already given it to you, make sure that you ask for it, and then tell them that you'd like, <coughs> excuse me, you'd like some time to review everything, right? And then once you've done all those things, you can start to do the happy dance and be so glad that you got the offer letter. And so now let's talk about what you should review in that offer that you have just received. So the ball is in your court, okay? So you should not feel um, like you need to be in a rush to accept an offer. So again, I think it's really important to kind of come back down to earth a little bit if you're really excited that the offer came in and take a deep breath and look at the offer with a clear objective mind. Because again, 
you want to get to the point, the vision is when you start your new job, you understand all the details around your employment and there are no surprises and there are no questions that could give you a little bit of a, a question mark in your head. Oh shoot, I wish I had covered that before I accepted the offer. So you wanna look at the offer with a clear and objective mind. That being said, you wanna tell the employer again, thank you, I, I appreciate it, I'm very excited about this. I'd like to take some time to review it. When do you need to hear back from me? So you want to clarify the expectation with the employer on, on the timeline. And so an employer might say, you know, reasonable expectation could be anywhere from one day to one week. Um, you want to, you know, you want to make sure that you clarify that up front. They might say, can you get back to us in 48 hours? Because if you don't accept, they might have a, a second choice candidate that they want to, you know, circle back to right away so that they don't lose that person. So be respectful of the employer's timeline, but also, you know, allow yourself enough time as possible to review everything. And so as you review everything, you know, there are really six key areas that we want to look at so that you can feel really comfortable about the offer. And so let's go into those one by one. The first one is obviously compensation. And this is usually one of the biggest sticking points or one of the biggest areas in which job seekers want to negotiate. And so there are different aspects though of your compensation. So at Advanced Group, when we talk about how we compensate our employees, it's not just about your salary, it's not just about your commission or your bonus, it's also everything that goes into rewards and so we call it total rewards and it's compensation but it's also time off and benefits and perks and training and development and all these things are really important aspects but let's just talk about the dollars for now you want to understand how often you're going to be paid and so you know are you going to be paid bi-weekly weekly monthly and and let's say it is bi-weekly when do you get paid is it the first and the 15th is it every two weeks and as a new employee, you know, depending upon your start date, where do you fall in the payroll cycle and when would your first date be? And so if you've been unemployed and, you know, again, it's going to be really important to you, you want to know, you know, the dates of payroll and when you're going to be paid and exactly how that works. When are you eligible for raises and how are raises determined? And so, you know, companies, um, Companies give merit increases based upon different things. And so, you know, maybe there's a, an annual merit increase cycle and the typical, and maybe there's a range of merit increases, two, three, four percent that are dependent upon your individual performance. You know, that could be the case or it could be something else. But it's important to understand how are raises determined, when are they given? You know, so if raises are given on April 1st, and you're starting your job, you know, on February 1st, you won't be eligible for a raise. You just kind of want to understand when that will take place. The third thing is to be crystal clear, and this is, you know, only if this applies to you and your role, but you want to be crystal clear on any incentive compensation. And by incentive compensation, I mean commission plans. And so you will most commonly find these in sales positions, inside, outside sales, what have you. But you want to really understand how you make your money. And if you are in a position where a, a big percentage of your overall compensation is incentive based, obviously you really need to understand it. And you know, you need to understand how it's calculated. You need to understand, you know, when it's paid out. And then another big thing is how long will it take you to ramp up your commissions? And I think this is important from a finance, you know, personal financial planning perspective. If it's really going to take you six months to ramp up your commissions and really get them to a nice, you know, high solid level, then you're going to need to, you know, you're going to need to understand that it, things might be tight for you for a few months um, until you get your commissions up to the level where, you know, you have some breathing room financially. Likewise, you want to understand if you are eligible for any bonuses. And so, you know, this might be annual bonuses, this might be performance-based bonuses, but you want to understand if you are eligible for bonuses, when are they paid out, how are they determined, and, um, and what, you know, what's the potential, and how do you earn that potential, or how do you maximize that potential. 
So really understanding the bonus. And then finally, you would see this in higher level positions, but if you are more at that executive level, are you eligible for any equity in the company, either through you know, stock purchasing programs or maybe you are granted equity in the company when you start, but you wanna understand how that works as well. You know, how much is it? How is it determined? Can it grow over time? You know, when can you, um, when can you sell your equity? When do you vest in your equity? So all those things, you know, if you if they are in the offer letter, but you still have questions, then there is absolutely nothing wrong with you coming back to the employer and scheduling some time to have them walk you through everything so that you're 100% clear. And the second thing that, <clears throat> that you want to review is the paid time off policies at the company. And so paid time off you know, includes everything ranging from vacation time to sick time to personal leave. And so you really do want to understand how many days you're eligible for. You know, do these allowances increase over time or with promotions? But how can you get more vacation time as your employment progresses? Does the employer use an accrual system or when does your PTO start? And this relates to this, this last box. You know, if you have PTO time that you have already planned. And so let's say you're getting married in four months and you have already planned a two week honeymoon. You wanna understand if you're starting a new job, you know, what it's gonna take for you to be able to take that time off. So like at Advanced, we accrue vacation time with every month that passes by. And so if you've just started, you have a honeymoon in three months, you might not have accrued enough time for your honeymoon. And so, um, so you would want to ask the employer, you know, look, I've already got a vacation planned. Can I have the vacation time up front? And most employers will be agreeable to that kind of a request. Is there a maximum number of days that you can take? And then it's not on here, but you also want to just know if what, and you know, what if any differences there are between, um, you know, personal days and sick days and vacation time, you know, bereavement time. I mean, it's just, you know, a solid company is going to have all of this laid out kind of in a benefit summary. That's what we do when we hire new employees so that our new employees know exactly what our PTO policies are and how they work. Another major component of accepting an offer is understanding the benefits that a company provides. And so the biggest, um, biggest benefit or, or most, most important benefit for most of us is, of course, health insurance. And taking the time to understand this is more important now than ever, just with all of the new regulations with the Affordable Care Act. I mean, companies have really had to um, look at their um, look at their healthcare insurance. It changes every year, premiums change every year. So it's it's really important that you understand, you know, what options are provided by the employer. Obviously, if you have a family and you're gonna be providing coverage for your family through the new employer. You know, it's even more important to you. But you want to understand the healthcare options and their costs and their coverage. And so, you know, for instance, if you already have physicians that you see um, just regularly, or perhaps you have a medical condition, you're going to want to understand: Are my physicians covered under this employer's healthcare plan? Um, that's a really important one. And then, obviously, understanding the cost is really important. So the last thing that you want to have happen, again, going back to our vision of understanding all the details, the last thing you want is you go to your new employer, you've started your job, you sign up for your benefits, and you see how much they cost, and you're like, wow, these benefits are expensive. So you want to understand how, the, how much the benefits cost. You want to make sure that you know about other insurance options, of course, like dental, vision, um, long, uh, long and short-term disability, any life insurance that the company offers. So it's important to understand all of those things. What retirement savings options does the employer offer? So, you know, the most popular one still, of course, is a 401k program. And you want to understand, you know, when can you start contributing to the 401k? How much can you contribute? And then, of course, does the employer match? You know, are there any matching contributions that come from the employer? And so, you know, understanding retirement, I, I know for a lot of people who are just starting their careers, 
retirement is probably one of the last things on their mind, but you know, planning for the future is important no matter what your age is. So understand how the new employer supports your long-term goals in terms of retirement. And then of course, what additional perks are there? So does the company offer tuition reimbursement? Um, do they offer things like um, discounted parking or discounted public transportation? You know, what additional um, things do they offer besides healthcare benefits, insurance, you know, other types of insurance, and then retirement benefits? Because all these things really do factor into, again, that, that total compensation vision. It's not just about your salary. If, you're, if their healthcare insurance premiums are off the charts, that impacts your pocketbook as well. So you want to make sure you understand it. The next one is your commute. And so this I think is especially important if you live in a metropolitan area like I do here in the suburbs of Chicago or if you live downtown or wherever you might live. If a commute is going to be involved, you want to understand that. So again, the last thing that you want is to accept a job, to start your job and say to yourself, Oh my gosh, I didn't know, I didn't realize it was going to take me an hour to get to work every day. I've never really driven this way. I mean, you want to understand what your commute is going to be like. And how does your company, how does the potential new employer support that? And so a lot of companies these days, um, you know, they, um, they, they do have discounted, you know, parking arrangements or, you know, especially in the city. Um, obviously in the suburbs, parking isn't nearly as much of an issue, but to me, it's more so how you're going to get there and how long that's going to take you. And so, um, you know, does the employer offer parking? Does the company have one of those discounted plans? And then if the commute is an issue for you, so let's say you live in Palatine and you're being asked to work downtown. And so you're like, fine, I can do that for a while. But is the company agreeable? Maybe they would say, you know, well, once you start, let's spend three or four months downtown, but then once you get, you know, on your feet and you've built relationships, um, two days a week, you can work from home. You know, so, so um, understanding exactly how much time you're going to spend in to and from is important. Your working hours, again, this seems super obvious, but a lot of times um, people will accept a job and then they start the job and they realize that, wow, people here don't really leave at five o'clock or gosh, people really get here at like 7.30 and really start get, you know, getting to work. And so you just kind of want to understand, you know, what time are you expected to start? What time are you expected to end? And so those might be the stated hours, but then what hours do people really work? And, you know, this might not be something um, that you might necessarily ask at the offer stage, but definitely as you are interviewing, you want to uncover that because, you know, let's say that you're a working parent and you need to get your kids, you know, from school by 5.30 each day. If it's the type of company where people don't really leave at five o'clock, people tend to work late, um, but you've got to leave at five o'clock, you know, it's just better to know that up front. So again, you don't have any surprises when your new job starts. And then finally, of course, you want to have really good clarity on your start date before you accept the offer. So if it was in the offer letter, then it is clear. But if you don't really know yet what that start date is, you want to know exactly when they want you to start. And, you know, if you, um, the reasons that you would want to know that, you know, maybe you've been employed for a while and it's really important that you start to have a paycheck coming in. But the new employer says, you know what, our next training class is in three weeks. And so we're going to have you start in three weeks and then you don't get paid until two weeks after that. You know, that's five weeks of additional time without any income coming in. So you just want to know that. And then likewise, the employer might say, you know, we are really overwhelmed and we would love for you to start in one week or in, you know, seven days or whatever it is. And, um, you know, but what if you still have projects that you're finishing up with the current employer or maybe there's a relocation that is involved. And so you just wanna be able to um, make sure that you have enough time to, to manage any personal things so that you can start on time with as little stress as possible. And so um, definitely don't resign from your current position until you're clear on when your new one starts. And so again, a solid company should have that all worked out and it should be clearly stated, but sometimes it's not. So it's just something that you wanna check into. And so now we'll get to the one of the meatiest parts of 
getting an offer, and that is negotiating the offer. So again, many times the offer is perfect. Salary looks great. You've talked about the benefits. You know when you're supposed to start. The commute is fine. Everything is cool. You're ready to go. But a lot of times the job offer is not perfect. And typically the biggest thing that is lacking is, you know, are the dollars. And so, um, so it's interesting about negotiating job offers. 49% of job candidates never negotiate the initial job offer. This is a statistic that I found from Fast Company Magazine. And so almost half of job seekers never negotiate the initial offer. And I thought that that was kind of a stunning statistic. And what it really relates back to is negotiating is stressful for a lot of people. A lot of people just don't like negotiation. They don't like um, sticking their neck out and asking for more. They're uncomfortable with it. They're afraid that, you know, they're afraid that it will, um, that it will annoy their new, you know, potential new employer. And so that idea, or you know, or they're afraid that if they try to negotiate, um, the, the employer will be so annoyed that they will rescind the offer. You know, so that fear of jeopardizing your offer is, um, is a real fear and it can be daunting. However, what a lot of job seekers don't realize is that most employers expect you to negotiate. You know, they, I mean, they're putting an offer out there based upon all the knowledge that they've gained and what they think makes the most sense. But negotiation, you know, most employers want a job offer to be a win-win situation, again, so that you start the job motivated and enthusiastic to be there. And so employers are not really taken aback if you try to negotiate. And, um, you know, and the only thing is, is to remember that if you do want to negotiate something, you have to be prepared that the employer will tell you no. And you have to be prepared that if they tell you no, um, do you want to walk away from that situation? And so, you know, the employer can walk away, you can walk away too. Um, but again, negotiating is, is, you know, is really common from the employer perspective. And then, of course, when you are done negotiating, again, Make sure that you get everything in writing so that you heard everything correctly and the employer heard everything correctly and you're on the same page. So we've got three different approaches. Oh, first of all, when you should, should negotiate and when you shouldn't negotiate. You should negotiate if you, if you have an offer letter in hand. Again, in my opinion, you don't really have an offer until you have an offer letter. And so, um, you know, you should negotiate if you can clearly spell out the value that you're bringing to an organization. So if in your last position, you were the company's top salesperson and you increased your personal revenues 300% in one year and you have product knowledge that has been built over years that, you know, is very hard to replicate, you're in a pretty good position to negotiate if you don't feel like the offer is high enough. You should negotiate if your instinct tells you that you might regret it. So you know that offer, okay, I got the offer, it's 60,000, but I was really hoping for 70, but I don't wanna lose the offer, but I know I'm worth 70. You know, if you feel like in your gut, you're, you're gonna settle for 60 and you're gonna start the job and you're gonna, you're gonna either be resentful or you're going to regret that you didn't at least ask, then you should go ahead and ask. Because the worst thing that the employer can say is no, we're unable to do that. And then you say, okay, fine. So if you think that you might regret it, you should, um, you should accept it um, or you should negotiate. And then you should also nego negotiate if you, if you know for sure that you're going to decline the offer unless they give you more money. So, you know, if, um, if, they've, if the employer has come in with a really low ball offer and you know it's a low ball offer, um, and if you, you know, there's no way you're going to accept that offer, then of course you would want to negotiate. Um, now, you should not negotiate if you've already accepted the offer. So this seems really obvious. But just to play this out, if you if you got a verbal offer, you said on the phone, you're like, 
oh my gosh, I'm so excited about this offer. You know, I, I look forward to getting the letter, but I will tell you, I mean, I know I'm going to accept this offer and thank you so much and blah, blah, blah. And then you get the offer letter and you see the salary and you see the bonus plan and you see how expensive the benefits are, or you know you're gonna have to commute an hour each way and now you're like, oh, wait a second. I, I don't know if I feel so good about this offer anymore. You know, now you're in an awkward situation because you've created an expectation with the employer that you're going to accept. And so now it's a little bit more difficult to come back and say, you know, I know I said I was going to accept, but I, I have a few hesitations. You know, again, that's just not that smooth acceptance. So, and then um, if the employer tells you this is their best offer, so if they say, okay, <clears throat> okay, John, you know, <coughs> Excuse me. We know that you were looking for seventy thousand. However, based upon the budget and based upon internal equity, you know what we're paying the other people doing the same job. The best that we can do is sixty-five thousand. If the if the hiring manager tells you that, I mean, then you have to accept that. You know, you have to be realistic and um and and if you keep pressing, uh, you know, keep pressing and keep trying to negotiate again, you're going to create a little bit of friction that doesn't achieve that vision of just a smooth onboarding process, okay? And then finally, do not negotiate if you cannot justify a higher salary. I mean, if you're switching careers or switching fields, you know, if you're someone who's fresh out of school and you don't really have any experience um, to speak of and you really just need to get your foot in the door, you know, if you, you have to be realistic and you have to, Say to yourself, okay, I'd like to make more money, but I really need to earn my stripes and I need to get in there and demonstrate my value first. But if you have unrealistic expectations, you know, okay, I know I don't have experience, but I'm a really hard worker and I'm energetic and I, I love this company. I really think I should earn $10,000 more when I start. You know, that's, um, that's going to come across as unrealistic. And so you should not negotiate. Okay, now, what to say when you want to negotiate. So again, just trying to, you know, some people might be comfortable with this, but if you're uncomfortable, if you're kind of dreading starting the negotiation process, all you have to say is something along these lines. Thank you for this offer. The job is what I want. The company is where I want to work. I want to work with the people in your organization. I would like to work with you on the terms of the offer if you're open to it. Okay, so that's just a nice, simple way of saying everything looks good, except I'd like to talk about a couple of things in the offer. And then you, you can use one of three potential techniques. There are probably a lot more techniques than this, but we picked three. So the first negotiating approach is to ask for more money without stipulating a certain number. And so, you know, you want to kind of put the burden of negotiating back onto the employer. Um, especially if you feel like they know their initial offer was too low. So, you know, and I'll be honest, I mean, a company's biggest expense, so the thing that a company spends the most money on is their employees, salaries, benefits. And so it's not like companies, well, maybe some companies, you know, try to be really cheap when it comes to salaries. I think a good company pays people what they're worth. But they definitely don't want to just throw money away as they're hiring new people. And so, you know, most companies are probably going to err a little bit more on the conservative side. But if you feel like the offer really did come in kind of low, then one great thing to say is I'm excited about the opportunity to start. I feel like, you know, this is going to be so great for both of us. Is there any way we can increase the starting salary? And so this employer might say, well, what do you want? Or, you know, where do you want to start? And then, of course, you should have a number in mind. Or the employer might say, um, let me go talk to some people and I'll come back to you. Or they might say, you know, I could potentially do um, $4,000 more. You know, but that's one technique that you can use um, if you want to see what they would come back with. The next technique is just a lot more straightforward and direct, and that is presenting a better offer if you feel like they're worth more. So again, some pointers here, be realistic, okay? So there are so many tools on the internet like salary.com or what have you where you can go and you can you know, get some benchmarks for your level of experience and, and what kind of salary others in your field are making. 
So you should do some research and you should be realistic. So um, the next thing is to be firm about your number. So when you're negotiating to so your salary or anything else in life, you're more likely to get results if you are firm. So if you say, I'm hoping to get a little bit more in a salary, I don't know, like a few thousand more would make me feel more comfortable. That's a little wishy-washy, right? But if you say, I know that the offer is at 60,000, but based upon what I've produced in the past and my skill sets and what I have to offer and what I've done and what I know I can do in your company, company I would feel more comfortable if the offer was 70,000. And so just be direct and be confident, right? Keep your offer high if you believe you have leverage. And so what I mean by leverage is if you have another offer from another company that is higher, um, that's leverage, right? Especially if you're in a high demand type of position like technology or what have you. So if you have a competing offer, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I want to be honest with you. You've offered me 60. I do have another offer that I'm at, but that offer is at 70. I like your company more, but the dollars are really important to me. Can you get, can you get the salary up to 70? And then I'll accept. And so there's nothing wrong with being that transparent. If you have um, a highly sought after skill set, you know, I, I mentioned technology. If you have, you know, a skill set that's in really high demand, um, you definitely have a lot more leverage. And there's nothing wrong with using that leverage, again, if you're being realistic. And then the last point here is don't be overly confident, you know, or, or arrogant about it. Um, but, you know, definitely have some confidence and, and make your case for why you think that the, the higher dollars are worth it. And then the third approach what if the employer just says, I'm sorry, this is the most I can do. You know, what you can try and do is weave into your, um, weave into your offer, maybe some changes in some other components of the offer. So like asking for more paid time off. So, okay, I, I know that you can't do anything when it comes to the base salary, but could I potentially have five additional PTO days, you know, in my offer or, um, you know, could I have a better match on my 401k or could I start investing in the 401k earlier? So at least then you feel like you're getting something. And again, from a total rewards perspective, five days of PTO time could be priceless to you, um, especially if you like to travel or what have you. So, so try and find some, way, some other ways to get an advantage or to get some um, more benefits from the offer that you have. So just a few points to remember. When you are negotiating, you really want to be gracious at all times. This you know, ne negotiation does not need to be contentious. It does not need to be confrontational. If the offer comes in lower than you were hoping for, um, you, you know, you shouldn't feel personally offended or angry at the company, you know, especially if you really do want to work there. So, Again, negotiation it happens a lot, and it's just a dance. You're trying to get a win, and the employer's trying to get a win. And so be gracious and responsive. Um, the tone that you use during a negotiation really conveys your professionalism and your style. And so, you know, be, being very courteous um, and not burning any bridges. You know, if you, if you have kind of a contentious negotiation process, and then you end up not accepting the offer um, or if the employer rescinds the offer, you know, it could be really, that could, that's a tense situation. And I just believe that the world is very small. You never know where you're going to run into a person again down the road or, or who knows who. And so I think just being gracious during, during negotiations, you know, in anything in life, but in particular, um, for the purpose of today, when you're negotiating a job offer, it's important to make sure that you're being conscious of that. And then accepting the offer. So this, of course, is the easiest stage. Again, make sure that everything is in writing. So if any of the terms of your offer have changed, you want to just get a fresh offer letter um, in hand from the employer. Again, if you have had some back and forth on, in negotiations, it's always nice and courteous to share appreciation for their patience and to share that enthusiasm. And then finally to ask about the next steps. And so, okay, you know, I know my start date is this, 
you know, will I be, um, a lot of companies will send onboarding materials beforehand, um, you know, as well as instructions on where you go for your first day and what you should bring with you if you need to bring your identification or whatever. So um, just make sure that you understand what those next steps are and you will be in good shape. I think it's always a good idea. Typically, if you get an offer letter, you're going to have to sign it and send it back. And so this is just an email. You could also, you know, of course, have a written letter with it. But I think it's just a nice touch to have a little offer acceptance no, again, just reiterates your enthusiasm, reiterates what you know are the terms of the offer or the final terms of the offer. And then, of course, you know, asking for, um, for any details on the next step. And just in review, we have covered the four main elephant, elephant, elements of the offer process. And so getting the offer, reviewing the offer, um, some techniques and things to remember when you are negotiating the offer. And then finally, that nice professional last touch in terms of how you go about accepting the offer and getting ready to start your new job. And so that is the core of our material for today. Before I turn to questions, I just want to make you aware, I have alluded to other job seeker webinars that we've done. I think that this is the 14th or 15th um, job seeker webinar that we have conducted. I mentioned at the start, all of our job seeker webinars can be found on our website at advancedresources.com backslash job seeker webinars. And so you will find recordings and slides of literally every topic, you know, how to use LinkedIn in your job search, how to prepare for a phone interview, um, you know, uh, how to ask interview questions, how to answer interview questions, how to use social media in your job search, how to find a job after college. So we have, I think, a very rich resource of material to support you and to help you achieve job search success. We also have on our website some really great um, pieces of content that also support you. And so, you know, we've got a, a piece about the resume or, you know, how to write the perfect cover letter, how to master the phone interview. So these are pieces that you can go to our website and you can download them um, to help you prepare for whatever stage in the job search process you feel like you need the most support. And so you'll find quite a bit of information there. And so um, our next session will be uh, Thursday, September 7th, and then Thursday, November 30th. And so the topics are to be determined on those. And then finally, you can definitely follow us on social media. We are constantly posting job search tips, motivation, news about advanced resources on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, you name it, we're kind of everywhere. So make sure you follow us. And then you can also subscribe to our weekly blog and get a wide variety of interview tips, questions, um, whatever it might be that we can, again, help you with our insights in the job search process. And so I'm going to turn to the questions really quickly. And let me see. Yes, a copy of the presentation will be emailed to you. So that will not be a problem. Um, I am finding that potential employers do not negotiate compensation and are requiring with any application to name a price. And so um, this is a really interesting topic. It, it actually, in the state of New York, some recent legislation passed that prohibits a recruiter, you know, either like a third party recruiter um, or like a recruiter in a, an actual company that prohibits a recruiter from asking about salary. So that's really interesting leg legislation that we're, you know, that we're all keeping an eye on. If a company is not willing to negotiate, and so if they just tell you flat out, this is the salary for this position, you know, I guess in, on one hand, that's a blessing because you know exactly what the compensation is for that position. So there is no dance. You, it's either a yes or no thing for you. Yes, I can work with that salary or no, that's not going to be enough. If they, if an employer, you know, we, we had talked about the salary question in other webinars and my advice um, is to always keep, you know, I don't like it. I don't like when, when salary comes up early in the job um, selection process. And so if it's just the first interview or something, I don't like it when, you know, when people try to pin down to a number. And the reason I don't like it is you don't know the employer well enough yet. 
and they don't know you well enough yet. And they haven't had that chance to really understand you. And so my advice that I've given in other webinars is if it's early on in the process, just the phone, you know, you're just at the phone screen stage or the first interview stage, and they're asking you for a finite number, my advice is to respond, you know, and, and to just say, you know, look, I saw the job posting, I understand what the range for this position is, and my salary expectations fall within that range. And then to follow up with a question, you know, what I'd really like to know is, you know, what are the goals and expectations of this position? Or what are you the most important attributes of the candidate for this role or, or what have you? Sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't, depending upon the employer. And you just have to read the situation absolutely adamant that you tell them what you are currently making, then you're going to need to tell them <laughs> what you're currently making, or you're probably going to annoy them or, you know, take yourself out of contention for a role. So you have to read the situation. But in an, in an ideal situation, um, that, you know, that, that, um, that kind of conversation happens later in the process. How many times can you revisit an offer in negotiation? So that's a good question. You know, can you go on forever and ever? Well, no. At, at some point, you know, you've got to um, you've got to pick and choose your battles. You've got to kind of um, you've got to kind of read the situation. And so, you know, if an employer has said, if you say, okay, thank you, I want to review this offer. I'll get back to you. When's a realistic time frame? And if the employer tells you, you know, we we really need to know as quickly as possible. Um, you know, because maybe they have another candidate they're considering, or maybe a project is scheduled to launch and they really need to get you on board. If you're going to, if you're going to keep coming back and it's a time sensitive situation, that's probably going to create some tension. You know, I think in negotiations, there's a certain pace to a negotiation. Um, and, you know, I think that you can tell when it's dragging on too long. And I, I, I would suggest negotiating, if you're negotiating effectively and you're putting all of your chips on the table and you're saying, this is what I'm looking for, you know, then they should come back to you. And I would say a negotiation cycle should have two, at most three phases, you know, and you've, you've got to be a, a good negotiator. So you don't want to say, okay, um, I'd like, you know, I'd like to adjust the salary and then they adjust the salary and you say, oh, you know, can I also get more vacation time? I mean, get your act together and, and, you know, and, and try to be as, um, as organized as possible with your negotiation. But I should say that, you know, you should be able to come together on terms, you know, within again, two, maybe three cycles of going back and forth, ideally. So again, that's ideal. It doesn't work in every situation, but hopefully it will work for you. How do you handle rejection if they say you are overqualified and they cannot meet your pay range? Well, it, it seems like that would probably have happened, you know, a little bit earlier in the process. I mean, the, the whole topic of being overqualified for a job is a really interesting one because you could be a more seasoned professional with more years under your belt and you're trying to get your foot in the door at a new company so you're willing to take less money but a company looks at all your years of experience and says why would you want to take a step backwards right so i feel like if you have had good conversations along the way in the interviewing process when it comes time for the offer hopefully um, hopefully you can avoid the situation where they say, well, we can't pay you that much. You're overqualified. I mean, hopefully that conversation has taken place earlier. And, um, and if it hasn't taken place earlier, you can always raise that topic. I mean, again, you know, everyone's got an expectation of a range that they want to fall within. And so, you know, without, again, without getting there too early in the process, somewhere along the discussion, you know, there should, there should be some communication of that expectation so that you don't get to the end. And they're like, well, what do you mean you want $20,000 more? You're overqualified. This role only pays 40,000. So again, that's, that's something that should probably have been addressed earlier in the process. Does an MBA work 
for you or against you in the market these days? So I'll give you my favorite response to every question. Um, it depends. <laughs> so I really think it depends. I mean, there are some positions, um, for instance, if you're trying to be a consultant at McKinsey or Bain and Company, you know, there's positions where if you don't have an MBA, you would never even be considered. And then there are some positions where an MBA is a nice to have. And so I think personally, for anybody who goes back to a school and invests their time and their dollars to further their education, to me, it's not so much about the degree that they got, it's the fact that they're a learner and they're hungry for knowledge. And I love that. So, you know, I really think it depends. Um, and so, you know, again, some companies, if you didn't have an MBA, they wouldn't even look at you. Some companies, I think it's a nice to have. Um, but again, I think the focus is on the fact that you want to continue to learn. Okay. What is the best source to find salaries online? So I mentioned salary.com, um, Career Builder. I, I believe that Career Builder has a salary tool now that you can um, that you can use. Um, Indeed.com, I think, also has a salary tool. Um, I in, a, in our last webinar, which was on using LinkedIn in your search, I talked about a tool that LinkedIn has if you are a premium subscriber. So, you know, on LinkedIn, you can have the free, free subscription or you can have the paid subscription. If you have a paid subscription, they have a salary tool that they just recently introduced within the last year. And then if those, um, if those ones that I mentioned still are not meeting your needs, if you just go to Google and type in salary calculator, it's going to give you, um, it's going to give you some good alternative. There is plenty of information online to help you determine what is a good salary expectation. Um, let's see. After completing an interview, I asked a worldwide company about the starting salary and was told they do not discuss starting salary in, in an interview. You know, if, it, if this was a company in New York, this is true. They can't talk, <laughs> they can't talk about salaries in interviews. And so, so it's interesting. And a company does not have to tell you the, um, the starting salary. However, you know, again, many companies post it right on the job posting on the website on Career Builder because I think it's to an advantage for a company to let you know the range because if you're completely out of the range, it is a waste of your time and their time to go through the process. So, um, um, but it is not illegal. So, a company has that right. The recruiter says they cannot tell me what the number is, but they will say, so I don't waste your time. So again, a recruit, again, it's a dance. I mean, again, if you're at the early stages in the process, the focus should be on your skills and ability, and can you do the job, and will you be successful in the job? And so a recruiter might not give you the number. I mean, they, you know, they, again, they're trying to focus in on the salary, and recruiters have a chance, this is like a recruiter in a staffing agency or a headhunter, Recruiter, they have the additional challenge of they're representing a client who's trying to hire you. So, um, so again, but, you know, but you can say, you know, this is the range I'm seeking. You know, does this position fit within that range? Because if it doesn't fit within that range, then, um, th th you know, it won't work. This is what I really need to make. And so I think that you can do that. If a recruiter continues to be evasive with you, in my opinion, you should maybe find a different recruiter. So. Um, but that's just my opinion. I asked for a range and the managers refused to even give a range. Again, it's, it's, um, it's not a violation. Again, in New York City, in New York State, they can't talk about salary legally. And this is, again, legislation I think will be interesting to see. Okay. All right, and then we have another question about salary ranges. So recruiters asking, <laughs> We've got like such a variety of recruiters who want a range and then recruiters who won't give a range. But, um, you know, I, I think that um, this person is saying that the recruiter is asking about the salary expectation or what you've made previously. I've tried deflecting, but most have been insistent. In most cases, I end up telling them a salary range I'm looking for. And that is my advice to give a range. And so, you know, it, it's if a recruiter is being really insistent that you tell them what you made previously, 
you know, I think that what you, what you made previously is not entirely indicative of what you should make in your next job because the circumstances could be totally different in the next job. Um, either more money or less money it could happen as well if you're changing industries potentially. And so if a recruiter is being insistent, I think you have to politely, I love what you said, I gave a range. And I think that you have to say, you know, it's, it's like naming a price. If you're trying to buy a house, naming a price that you're going to pay for a house that you haven't even seen yet. And so if a recruiter is being insistent on the exact salary that you're aiming for, I feel like, you know, I feel like you can professionally say, I feel like it's really early for us to talk about that because I don't know enough yet about this job. And what I'd like to do is learn more and then talk about, you know, what value I provide and how it could fit into the company and what that's worth. And so I think that, um, again, every situation is different. If you have a recruiter who is just a stickler about it, sometimes you just have to go with it, especially if it's a job that you're really, really interested in. You just have to read the situation. Okay. And I think that, let's see. Here's a question. What is a good way to handle getting a job offer? We've got about five minutes left. What is a good way to handle getting a job offer from one employer when you are close to getting a job offer from another employer? Is it okay to go to the second employer and tell them you have received a job offer to see if they are ready to make you an offer? This is a really good question, first of all, you know, kudos to you for having two potential offers um, coming your way. So that's exciting. So yes, honesty is always the best policy. Of course, I hate to be cliche, but it is. So if you have a job offer from one company, there's another company that you've had all those buying signals from, and you're pretty sure you're getting another offer. There's nothing wrong with going to that second company and saying, look, I want to be transparent in what's happening in my search. You know, I have received a job offer. Um, obviously, I want to respond to this job offer in a timely fashion. Um, at the same time, I'm very interested in your company, and it seems like things have been going well, you know, in the interview process. So I wanted to let you know that I do have this other job offer. You know, I'm hopeful that I would get a job offer from your organization, but obviously, I, I have a timing issue now, you know, and, and what are your thoughts on the next steps with your organization? So. I think that that is, you know, a, a good recruiter or a good hiring manager will appreciate that because if they don't know that you already have an offer, um, you know, they, it's not like they might be dragging their feet, but, you know, if they know that you have another job offer, that could speed up their sense of urgency and, and help move things along. But if they don't know, um, then they don't know. So I would absolutely be transparent and honest with that second company. Let's see. It's so easy employers saying you are overqualified. In this case, how would we overcome the situation? It's a really great question that we get all the time. And so, and again, my answers are always easier said than done, but if you are overqualified for a job, I think what you have to focus on is don't focus on the fact that you're overqualified, but focus on the value that you're going to bring in the job. So. You know, maybe you say, okay, I know, you know, I know I've got more years of experience than this job requires. But I think that that is actually hugely beneficial to you because the training time is going to be less for me. You know, I will be up to speed and more productive, probably faster than anyone else that you could hire for this role. And I will bring more value to the team because I have more perspective and more experience. And I, you know, and and I, I recognize that I have more experience than you require, and I want to prove that that doesn't matter. I want to prove the value that I bring. And so don't keep the focus on having too many years of experience or being overqualified. Keep the focus on what value you are going to bring to that company. And if you keep the focus on that, then that's the positive that you want to you know, keep their attention on, not so much the fact that, gosh, you're overqualified, you're going to be bored, you're going to, you know, don't, don't let the mind go there. So when you give a salary range, do they always take the lowest number you state in the range? No, I mean, we don't, you know, I, I think that what is important is, 
you know, what is going to work for the employer and a lot of different things go into the salary for a position someone's hiring for, such as, you know, what, what did the last person who is in the job make? What do the other people in the company make? A lot of companies have pay grades, and so they might say, okay, for this customer service level one position, the salary range is this to this, and they stick within those pay grades. And then, of course, they look at, you know, your experience and what you should be compensated at. And a smart company wants to compensate a new hire in a way that the, the new hire feels good about it. You know, and a company doesn't want to bring someone in, lowball the offer, feel like they got a great deal, and then have the employee feel like they're being shortchanged. And so a range is a range. And I would, I would say, you know, again, companies are conscious of their salary cost because that is the largest cost to an organization, but not every company is, is trying to just get the, the cheapest offer on the table. Although to you as a job seeker, it probably seems that way. Okay, and as of right now, we have hit the one o'clock mark. And so again, if there are questions that I have not answered, I will circle back with you through email over the next couple of days and, and try to respond to your question. But with that, um, in closing, I just want to thank you for your time and your attention. There have been so many great questions today. And again, I know that the offer seems like a simple topic, but hopefully you are walking away with a tip or two that will help you have a great experience through the offer acceptance process. So thank you so much. And on behalf of Advanced Resources, we hope that you have much job search success and a great day. Thanks so much.